meals. And when Megalodon wanted a three-course dinner, it may have gone after a beast even bigger than itself. The modern blue whale is a magnificent animal. Rarely photographed and usually seen only by accident, this massive marine mammal is a startling reminder of the awesome majesty of some of the sea's most elusive creatures. Five million years ago, the whales Megalodon encountered may have been almost as impressive. Here I'm just thinking about what modern uh, things like fin whales and blue whales look like. Uh, it would have been a, a, a coastal animal, it would have been a migratory animal. It probably was gray with a lighter shade below. We usually estimate the, the weights of living baleen whales at about a ton of foot. So if you have an animal 75 to 80 feet long, it'd be about 75 to 80 tons. So you've got at least five species there. You know, those actually look like herpetocetines, the weird kind of pseudotherids. Dr. Lawrence Barnes and his colleagues have uncovered hundreds of whale bones in the last few decades. One intriguing discovery was a large whale found near Santa Barbara with a shark tooth tip stuck in its jawbone. Here was a creature that was possibly three to nine meters longer than Megalodon, a whale that would have outweighed the shark by 22,000 kilograms. But the reward for killing a larger whale would have been a much bigger food source for the Megalodon. A whale of this size is packed with layers of tough, stringy blubber. Megalodon would need all of the size volume and deadly serrations along its teeth to take down the animal. The key this time is bite force. How much jaw power did Megalodon actually have? At the University of New South Wales in Australia, Dr. Stephen Rowe is using high-tech computer sleuthing to try and understand the cranial mechanics of bite force found in modern and prehistoric animals. Bite force is the amount of pressure applied when the jaws of an animal bite down on its prey. What's generating the bite force here are the actual jaw closing muscles. What we're looking at is a simple lever system. So we apply force on one end of the lever and we get a reaction force on the other end of the, of the lever. Rowe's process for understanding bite force in sharks starts with the gruesome task of CAT scanning a shark head at a local hospital. I then build a, a surface model and from that I can then create a solid three-dimensional engineering model or finite element model. From this engineering model, Rowe has figured out the potential maximum bite force of the modern great white shark. In the case of a really big white pointer, we're predicting a bite force around about 4,000 pounds. These largest of white pointers are really pushing the envelope as far as living animals are concerned. With the bite force per inch data from the great white, Rowe extrapolates what he believes to be a fairly accurate understanding of the bite force of the megalodon shark. Toward the upper end of estimates of body mass for megalodon, uh, we're getting bite force estimates of about 40,000 pounds, which is just humongous. With 40,000 pounds of bite force, you could bite through a truck if you had the teeth and jaws to stand up to it. This must have been an absolutely terrifying object to any whale. Of course, living large baleen whales get very, very anxious when they see or hear um, orcas or killer whales. But the sight of one of these guys coming coming at them must have been just absolutely horrific. The baleen whale didn't have much time to be anxious once the attack had begun. It would appear that Megalodon typically took out large whales by swimming up behind them, biting their tail flippers off, basically just disabling the whale's propulsion system altogether. This is certain death for the whale as he bleeds out through a gaping hole in his artery. But with no hands to hold down his enormous prey, how did the Megalodon keep the 68,000 kilogram whale from swimming off after one bite to the belly or throat? At Wright State University in Ohio, paleontologist Chuck Ciampaglio has constructed an experiment that demonstrates the deadly potential of the Megalodon to attack a giant prey item. 
A high density gel mold will simulate whale flesh. The centerpiece of the demonstration is a set of mechanical megalodon jaws that he believes simulates the unique jaw motion of the shark's mouth. These jaws are really interesting because in addition to being able to lift up and down, they also are highly mobile in a forward direction, just like modern laminids and megalodon would have been also. The metal jaws are firmly attached to the table, and instead of having the jaw attack the mold, the bite is replicated by having the mold rolled into place inside the mouth. The shark uses its lower teeth to initiate the attack and hold its prey in place. We can see the lower teeth anchored into the flesh a good three inches. It's already starting to tear the flesh. This is holding down the flesh, and now the top is going to make its bite. The upper jaw bites down on the prey with its powerful serrated teeth. At that point, Megalodon would thrust back and forth until a bite was made. The bottom jaw continues to anchor into the gel flesh, while the unique upper jaw, with its ability to move somewhat independently from the rest of the skull, takes bite after bite, pulling flesh into its mouth as it continues to feed. OK. What we've created are massive wounds to our prey item. We can see that the teeth have made huge gouge marks has split off nearly half of the flesh. Now, if this was the actual shark, this piece of flesh would extend out in both directions, probably three or four feet because of the size of the jaws. And you would have probably nearly 40 teeth sinking into the flesh. The mechanical jaws leave no doubt about the powerful combination of bite force and cutting power that Megalodon used on prey like the Santa Barbara whale. Within minutes, the whale is nothing but a tasty carcass floating south along the California coast. For one more day, Megalodon has found a meal, a very big meal. But unfortunately for Megalodon, during the Pliocene epoch, ocean temperatures started to cool. The numbers of whale species were also diminishing. Megalodon's reign as the all-time apex predator of the sea could be nearing its end. Megalodon disappeared from the fossil record during the Pleistocene epoch, around 1.8 million years ago. Scientists are unsure why this efficient hunting machine's time at the top of the predator list came to a close. Extinction is always something that fascinates people. We want to know not only how things live, we want to know why they died, why they're no longer around, why they're no longer with us. The assumption there, though, is always that extinction is somehow the fault of the animal or the species that goes extinct. It's because it was poorly adapted or a negative thing. That's not necessarily always the case. Clearly, species want to perpetuate their existence. Paleontologists are unsure what finally killed off the shark. Could another apex predator, like the killer whale, have wiped out the megalodon? Another intriguing possibility is changes in climate. Six to 1.8 million years ago, just as megalodon teeth disappeared from the fossil record, scientists have noticed a cooling in the ocean temperatures. This may have adversely affected a shark accustomed to swimming in warmer waters. Paleontologists also know that as the Miocene epoch progressed, the population of smaller whales was replaced by larger whales. These whales may have favored colder climates to the north. It might very well be that as whales became migratory and spent the summertime in northern latitudes, that in fact the, the sharks just weren't, uh, didn't have access to the, the big whales. By the middle of the Pliocene, without year-round access to larger prey, Megalodon may have been feeling acute hunger pangs. With a loss of a large portion of the whales, perhaps three quarters of all the whale species at the time, we ended up losing a major food source for Megalodon. The giant shark would have become increasingly desperate for food. Cannibalism was always a possibility with Megalodon, but could have increased as other sources of food thinned. Smaller Megalodon teeth have been found in deposits alongside other marine mammals that were prey items for the shark. There is speculation that these juvenile megalodons may have been at risk from bigger, hungrier megs. 
the closing of the land bridge in South America may have also affected the worldwide migratory patterns of some marine animals. The disappearance of the Central American Seaway and its replacement by land bridge um, and the effect upon marine organisms has been debated among scientists. We look at things like even the modern sperm whales. The same species exist in both the Atlantic and Pacific. And the question is, are they going around the southern continents? Or are they just very slow to evolve? It is unclear if the closing of the isthmus of Panama that connects North and South America could have affected Megalodon. Scientists continue to search for clues about Megalodon and its demise by studying the great white shark. For starters, the modern great white is equipped with a remarkable internal heating system known as gigantothermy, which is an excellent survival tool. Most fish are cold-blooded, and the grey white isn't. It's warm-blooded. It elevates its body temperature up above the ambient water temperature, which for a long time was a characteristic solely assigned to mammals. And they do that with a special system of blood vessels that actually warms the blood that supplies critical parts of the shark's sensory biology, so the eyes, the nose, uh, particularly. Paleontologists have not yet figured out if Megalodon possessed this extraordinary biological capability. If they did not, as temperatures cooled, it's possible the Great White was in a better position to withstand the dip in the ocean temperatures. More importantly, scientists believe having more variety in its diet probably helped the Great White Shark. While Megalodon was primarily preying on larger marine mammals, the Great White was able to eat smaller prey items and fish. They need less biomass to keep going. Uh, there's probably not as much pressure, if you will, as there is on an apex predator the size of Megalodon, which would mean it need a tremendous amount of biomass to maintain its, its existence. In essence, unlike the Great White, Megalodon may well have eaten its way out of existence. The Great White was clearly a more adaptable animal, and as a result, it flourishes in oceans around the world to this day. But the question of whether these two magnificent sharks were related continues to interest scientists. Paleontologist Chuck Ciampaglio and other experts insist there was little direct relationship between Megalodon and the Great White. According to Ciampaglia, advanced computer technology underscores the differences between the two animals. I think one of the things I'd like to see cleared up is that to allow Megalodon to be called, you know, Carcaracles Megalodon, change the name, separate it out from the Great White, and let's get on with business at this point. The Great White Tooth and the Megalodon Tooth do have some markings in common. Both are triangular and serrated. But the Great White Tooth and its prehistoric ancestor have little or no scar at the base whereas the Megalodon clearly has a prominent chevron-shaped scar. And blowing up the great white tooth to the same height of a Megalodon tooth reveals that even at the same length, the great white fossil tooth is noticeably thinner and more gracile than the Megalodon tooth. Well, let me, let me do the converse here. Let me show you a very small Megalodon, about approximately the same size as this great white, and you can see that small sizes the Megalodon doesn't look the same. Again, the serration densities are different. This tooth is distinct from this great white, no matter how big you make it. The team compared the dentition of the modern great white, the extinct mako, and megalodon. And what we found consistently was whether or not we looked at the root, the blade, or the entire tooth, was that the extinct mako and great white always clustered together for every tooth position, while megalodon always clustered away. Megalodon and great white are not directly related. Megalodon is not the extinct great white, and all scientific evidence points to this. Or does it? Looking all the way back to the first jaw recreation in 1909, there are scientists who still insist the great white shark is more directly related to the megalodon. The smoking gun? Rare fossilized megalodon vertebrae. The backbone anatomy suggests that megalodon and great whites are quite closely related to one another. These researchers are turning to work being done on the centra of megalodon vertebrae to support this theory. I think because the vertebral centra haven't been as thoroughly studied, they provide some very important clues, and I think they, they ought to be studied very carefully. But megalodon centra are not common. 
worldwide for the uh, 16 or 17 million years that it lived, we probably have 